and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. One of the one of the mat one of the madmen behind loading crew crafts who have developed a lot of um in, of invasions of weeb shit into D into D and D and now doing a full on book with the complete waifu handbook which managed to get funded in ha less than in less than an hour. Oh. Mm -hmm. The one and only Stuart Jones, not to be confused with. John Stuart Mill on a half a pint of Shandy who is particularly ill. <laughs> Sorry, wrong script. <laughs> Howdy, friendos. My name is Stuart, and uh, it's nice to be here. Uh, so, I'm legally required to make at least one Monty Python joke, so I went with the Drunken Philosopher song. Uh, absolutely no. I, I have unfortunately I'm not super not super familiar with all the Monty Python sketches. The only other one aside from Holy Grail is uh, the Ministry of Silly Walks. So that one that one just flew right by me. Sorry. So you would so you would not be able to hold yourself if you went to an argument clinic. Definitely wouldn't be able to do that now. <laughs> oh, or. Or, or um, if somebody walked, if somebody walked into your show de demanding demanding a refund for a dead parrot. Yep, that's that parrot is might be dead, but it's going right over me. <laughs> this parrot is no more. It has ceased to be. But I do, I, I do, I do appreciate that. Before we went live, you had you had subbed to my my channel, which is inching closer and closer to that two thousand mark, um, which I'm both which I'm both happy about and dreading because once it hits two thousand stably, I'm gonna have to cover um, Traveler five point one, and I'm I've tried to avoid that as best I can. <laughs> now I'm I'm not exactly familiar with Traveler. Could you could you give me a refresher on that one again? <sighs> <laughs> Traveler is one of the earliest entries, in, as far as space opera, in the tabletop gaming space. It got its start in the late seventies by GDW, and it has done a whole lot of system and company hopping ever since. Ever since GDW went belly up um, in the eighties, like it's it's gone it's gone through its own additions. It's gone through a few reboots. It's gone through transfers to other systems like Hero System and D twenty back during the D twenty bubble of the two thousands. And there's two versions, one by Mongoose and one that isn't. The latter one is the one that is a bit, um, a bit messier, and that's the one I've tr I've tried to avoid. I narrowly avoided it in my last milestone because it was put up to a vote about which one I would cover. <laughs> but hmm. at the very least, I'm not covering the I'm not covering anything like the Unholy Trinity. So, um, Mulligan. <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> I I am I am partially familiar with the unholy trinity. I, I at least I suspect what one of them is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um the unholy trinity for the for those who aren't familiar with my pre with my previous rantings on the matter is fatal which every which everybody should know and fear. Um World of Cinnabar which is um the kind of game that you cannot make sober. Somebody was clearly on something with that, because how can how can you be sober when one of your monsters is a flying clam that has a flamethrower in its mouth? <laughs> no, I'm not. Or flying bears with laser beam eyes. Fair enough. <laughs> oh, and Senzar is and Senzar the third of which is the least offensive, but. Is akin to what happens when you're 11 years old and you think you can write A, D, and D better. <laughs> so the it, it the last one is like uh, from what I understand that it, that one is definitely not uh, what the kids would call problematic, but it is just weird. Yeah, it's the it's the least offensive of the three. It's just real. It's just really dumb, almost almost crack fic level dumb. And the fact that it had the subtitle "The New Millennium in Role Playing" is just tempting fate. 
So it's funny you mentioned uh, Fatal because a little while ago I was teaming up with another YouTuber to do a like documentary on the entire thing. And I got to the point where I actually got a hold. I got the phone number of one of the creators. Oh, and oh God, he, you didn't talk to Hall, did you? It wasn't Hall. It was his buddy. So Hall did like 80% of the work. And then his buddies uh, did like the rest of it. And that guy contributed. He, he, he told, he tells me he contributed like 9% and hall is just kind of fallen off the face of the earth. I am desperately trying to get a hold of him, but the Everybody's other guy been trying to get a hold of him. <laughs> the other guy has volunteered to come down from his actual place. Cause uh, we live close. We live within driving distance and he offered to come to my house and DM a game. And I absolutely want to do that so bad. <laughs> like, that sounds like a great time. <laughs> if you haven't tur if you haven't been able to suss out the guy who made the complete waifu handbook is a little weird. Then again, then again, and this is the reason I brought up loading crew crafts. This is, Far from your first rodeo, when it comes to when it comes to creating weeb shit for the world's most litigious role playing game. Yes, sir. Um, it's funny how this got started. Um, I I got my start making a Dragon Ball esque uh, like class and race for Pathfinder, um, and that's because when we would play in person, you know, before the internet stuff. Um, my wife refused to play anything that she didn't like personally like she she is a person I would lovingly describe as having weaponized autism and because of her stubbornness I created the keymaster uh the ultimate uh, something like the key master bundle for pathfinder first edition it came with a race it came with five races a class a prestige class all meant to emulate dragon ball and then Back in December, I did a crossover with Little Karibo. Uh, it, <clears throat> excuse me. To those that don't know, Little Karibo played um, Frieza in Team Four Stars Dragon Ball Z Abridged series, and we did an alignment video, uh, basically a video essay explaining Frieza's D and D alignment. Um, and in it, uh, Martin was kind enough to do a very funny shill for me. And in that shill, we sold a lot of books <laughs> like a lot a lot of books and people were like wow this is really cool i need you to do it for 5e and i said cool i don't play that fucking game give me a minute to practice so i created this small little booklet it had a pathfinder uh, prestige class called waifu and then i made a bunch of subclasses all for dungeons and dragons fifth edition that were waifu flavored and i create it i called it the complete waifu handbook and it was just meant to be a valentine's day shit post it was not meant to be taken seriously and I the day before I was about to post it, some fucking guy named Mine Flameblade in my community post said, "Hey, you're gonna add waifu races so I can play as a fox girl, right?" And since that, it, since then that has been my last six months was just absolutely perfecting this ridiculous book, uh, which at the moment is nearly done with its beta test phase um and we're about to get everything in the initial book finalized um and now we're just working on stretch goals stretch goals and artwork and it'll be ready to ship soon mm -hmm. and i did now obviously that obviously some people some people are always aghast at the idea of mixing weeb shit with with the with um with tabletop, but everybody, everybody, um, clearly, conveniently forg forgets their history because there, because there is one, there is one man who, ev who everybody, who everybody um, should know in one form or another for hi for his contributions that also that wrote a DBZ um, TTRPG long before anybody thought long before anybody thought it would be a cool idea to do so. That being Pondsmith. Yes, he uh, he made the he made like four books too. Like it wasn't just one book. He it was not a college. Tr it was not like the uh, like hit it and quit it. He he really tried to make that game work too. Mm -hmm. 
And I believe I I believe I actually did a crossover video with Dabby Chappy, like roughly explaining the role uh, rules of that one. Yeah, admittedly, it, admittedly, his take is definitely definitely a little bit rough, largely because he was trying to make his um make his interlock system work for it and round peg and a square hole and all that. Mm -hmm. But I've I've argued. I've argued that not only is um, mixing anime and, t and TTRPGs, whether it be D&D or otherwise, um, far more of a thing than people realize, I argue that, it's, that it needs to be more of a thing because I don't know about you, but I'm getting sick of this idea of what you're supposed to do when it comes to fantasy. I've been sick of that for years. Yeah, I... I... In an avoidance to talk a bunch of shit about uh, certain companies um, or getting too political, I have not been happy with the content that's been coming out of a lot of the fantasy space lately. I have found in my experience, when I try to write the plot as anime as possible, it's way more fun. It's so much more fun, like just going like balls to the wall crazy and just making everything huge and reactionary. Mm -hmm. There's... <laughs> There's, of course, there's there's also the fact that now from I want to I want to make clear when I say this I don't have any res, I don't have any resentment to say um, Tolkien's work or anything like that I just don't like the idea of if I'm doing fantasy that that's what I have to do um, in the temple we call this design by gospel but um get. I want I want to spend a bit of time getting into the origin sto origin story, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. Since you mentioned not since you mentioned having to do a crash course on on Five E, did you get your did you get your start with Pathfinder or did you get your start much further back? Yo, I am old school as hell. I got I cut my teeth on Second Edition AD and D. I I started like really late, like 2006, when I was 16 years old, and my buddy invited me to his, uh, like his uh, his family's like trailer where we were in like this really um, cramped space. We had like a really bad card table between all of us, and he and his family read the rules very wrongly and they handed me the second edition book and said this is the good game we're going to play this and i grew up playing second edition and i loved it because to me the crunch in second edition is not very fun uh i i, I know i'm not the only person who gets war flashbacks saying thacko but um don't you i know don't fucking start with me in i will invoke his name and you cannot stop me <laughs> <laughs> you have no you have no idea how deep how deep the rabbit hole goes. I sure do cuz um I I played a lot of second edition. I played some first edition and then uh my buddies uh stubbornly got pulled into third edition right when fourth was starting, weirdly enough. We got pulled into third edition. We realized, oh, these are much better rules. <laughs> like the fluff is not as interesting, but the crunch was way better. And then uh, Pathfinder was introduced to me, and to me, that's been the gold standard ever since. Is Pathfinder first edition? Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm no str I'm no stranger when it comes to when it comes to Pathfinder first and second. I've I've had the guys behind Spheres of Power on the sh on the show in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, which it in its in itself is an interesting thing that even though it wasn't designed to do weeb shit, it um it can do it very <laughs> easily. Oh. I, I I find that Pathfinder is so flexible; it can do just about anything. Like like what's frustrating to me about Five E is the de the design space in Five E is so broad that it's kind of narrow. Does that make sense? It does because like, um, not to get too far into a tangent, but. Oh, one. There is one big lie that people both both when it comes, regardless of D and D edition, and even even Pathfinder stands have fallen into this trap. Mm -hmm. There is this mindset of oh you can you can use this to run any to run any kind of fantasy. Mm -hmm. Here is the here's the pro here's the problem though. the 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 actual the actual mechanics have a ver have a very clear skewing, and it isn't. written and bo and um it's never been written with a particular 
with a particular setting in mind, Pathfinder has a little bit of an edge on this because you have because you have a you have a built you have a built-in setting there. D and D doesn't really have it. I know some people will say Forgotten Realms is no, it isn't. Um, I know some people might say um, Miss Mistara is the is the default setting. No, it isn't. Um, those are those are settings that are added onto what is trying to be a fr a framework, and mm -hmm. the test that I'll always bring up to people is pop quiz. What is the most mm -hmm. common way to equip a fighter? A sword, I guess. Sword and board. Mm -hmm. You know, lo long sword or bastard sword sometimes, and large shield. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to do that when you're dealing with a culture like, say, Japan, or doing it, or doing a Japan adjacent affair, like Karatour was, um, when culturally speaking, shields aren't a thing there. I do not want to um actually you, but um actually, <laughs> like they they definitely did have sword and board and like the like the modern like Japanese fantasy of like two handed katanas and and doing like all the samurai stuff. It's still relatively modern in like uh like an ancient Japan sense because way back when it was all like. You know, a lot. They had a lot of Chinese culture in there, and the kusanagi, the grass cutter sword, is a Chinese style sword. Yeah. Um, the so po that's the point, the point that I'm getting <laughs> at is that pr is when it comes to any. And if I have if I have to use something outside of Japan, I'll use India, where the sword isn't the big weapon that has the cult that has that massive cultural footprint. It's the bow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The point. And of of course, of course, weapons like katars would are supposedly exotic weapons. But if you're in, if you're in a setting where if you're in a if you're in a Indian themed fantasy setting, wouldn't that be a little bit more com a little bit more common? Is something is something else to to bring up the whole idea of exotic weapons? Kind of undercuts the any kind of fantasy because what is what is exotic in one place might be common in another. Fair enough. I do see that point. And when we were designing for um, my own settings in the past, that was an issue coming up. It's like, hey, my 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 elf is from the Japan country. Can I just be? Can it be a katana for me? Like, can this be a martial weapon for me? And it's like, yeah, why not? Yeah, <laughs> you know. I know some people will say just house rule it, but I've always held the belief that house ruling should be a spice, not the main dish. And I don't mm. know about you, but I don't. But I don't plan on. Drow drowning my steak in in a pound of cilantro or something, <laughs> but get, getting to getting to the oh, subject ma to the heart of the matter. Now, mm -hmm. as I understand it, you are you are making the complete waifu handbook compatible three ways for five e and for both editions of Pathfinder. Mm -hmm. So. I suppose the I suppose one of the easy spots to go into is what what some of the ups and downs have been for des essentially designing for three games at once. Well, admittedly, um, I again I I'm so used to ignoring settings like in terms of when I design a class race or whatever that it the the setting of Pathfinder or Forgotten Realms or whatever has always been a non-factor for me. I've just either ignored it or did what I want. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's rarely been an issue for me. When I, when I design, I could do Pathfinder 1E pretty, maybe not masterfully, but very competently at this point. It's not, it's not hard. Right now, I'm still learning 5E. Like right now, um, actually yesterday, in fact, as of this recording, um, I had a live stream going over all the 5E subclasses. And the consensus was... These are all very cool ideas, but um, the big one that that stuck out in people's mind, like for example, uh, my cleric domain. Uh, I, I have a uh, one called Cupid domain that basically created a bow fighter for a cleric, and 
um, immediately on paper, all the ideas are, are really rad. But my guy who's been doing the lead beta testing for me, we just realized late last night, oh, half of this won't work, so we're going to need to redo a good chunk of it. Um, as, ostensibly, it's just designing around the core book, and that's not terribly difficult. Pathfinder 2E is being handled by my one buddy, however, Josh Scorcher. He's another YouTuber. I think he's approaching 200,000 subs. Yeah, I, I, I know I know of him. Oh. And he's... Uh, he, I trust him when it comes to Pathfinder 2E. He's been playing it since it's, it came out. He has homebrewed for it before, and I have I've let him... I've Excuse me. I've had him DM a couple games for me, and he's quite excellent. So, yeah. And for for me, it's it's more of I've whenever I whenever I see this this notion of designing for multiple games, I always end up getting flashbacks to um to when Alderac tried to do that with both legend with both Legend of the Five Rings and Seventh C, mm -hmm. where. They tried to they tried to accommodate both D and D third edition and their own roll and keep system in the same book. Mm -hmm. The problem is the on, the only thing that those two systems have in common is you roll dice. <laughs> it, <laughs> they are one of them is a one of them is a D ten based die pool with exploding dice that doesn't even have classes per per se. And, du and doubles down on an attribute and skill relationship, and the other, and of course, the other one is third edition D and D. <laughs> right. Um, there was a similar thing that happened with um, Big Eyes Small Mouth um, ba back in the day, where it tried to do its do its own marriage between um, the between the tri stat system that it developed and um, the D twenty system. It was a mess. I've heard some people it had it as their had it as their entry point, but um, if your if your entry point is if your if your entry point in say um, Star Trek movies is is Star Trek Five, that might have been your entry point, but it's still Star Trek Five. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, again, I I feel like I am good enough at the one system. And have you have you seen my channel before? Uh, this is going to sound weird. I've I did some skimming when I was when I was doing my research because I seem to have lucked into being a better journalist than pro than proper games journalists. <laughs> Fair enough. So, um, you know, my channel, I do a lot of video essays on character alignment, and I always felt like. Um, my strengths were on uh, character, like setting, world building, things like that. Um, I I feel like you can pretty much bend most things to fit. I I just never really struggled that hard on it. I, I maybe that's a, maybe that's a brag. Maybe I'm ignorant. Maybe whatever. But like again, this wasn't terribly difficult. I just made it it's the, all three games are d20 systems all of them have a threshold on where their numbers go and if i couldn't play with numbers directly i just went sideways and developed like um you know like sideways abilities for example um one of our races is divine dragon hmm. and in 5e uh some of their things just weren't uh, useful. So, like, I, I design, I, I designed for it in Pathfinder first. One of their abilities is called Divine Font, where they don't need to worship a deity to get divine spells. That's really cool for Pathfinder, but means nothing in Five E. So, when I put it into Five E, I was just like, "Hey, you get a cantrip from the cleric spell list." Like, that wasn't like you could just do that. You know, it's eh, <laughs> it's it it's meh. It wasn't terribly difficult to design around, and I could just put in the flavor text whatever I want to make up for it. Mm -hmm. So, and I can I and look looking at it, it is that you would you would mention within within each of within each of them. I'm I'm curious if it's a case where you designed for one system first and then. Um, ha then hand it off to the others to kind of convert the initial approach, because mm -hmm. I do see oh, a I... lot of um, notes from Stuart <laughs> in the in the beta. 
Oh yeah, and they're gonna stay in the uh, final book too. I personally like it when the author of a book like sends me little notes. Like one of the reasons I love Pondsmith's books is Pondsmith is always writing cute notes to the reader, and I love seeing that. So I I absolutely will write notes to my uh, players saying, "Hey, it, it may not work here, but." make it work here <laughs> you know like just hand wave it this is not meant to be taken super seriously and there are certain of course there's certain things that have to change but if you want to know like what i designed for first i designed for pathfinder first edition first mm -hmm. yeah I, f I figured because eventually you've got to ha you have to have a chicken you've got to have an egg because there's no there's no way you could um no, no way you could you could stat it up. You could stat everything out with just one in with just one in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's it's the it is is it possible that could, that could be done? Yeah, but you'd need to be a special breed of crazy. Yeah, it's um, one of the big challenges that we had was for, uh, especially for Pathfinder Two E is they radically changed how racial features work. Where you have like a like a restaurant style menu, mm -hmm. and you pick it up as the character levels up, and I love that a lot. But you know that that radically changes the races between the systems, and that I guess that was the most challenging. But then again, since I passed uh, passed that, excuse me, I kicked that can down the road to Josh. He picked it up for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and well, the. Well, it's I like I like in I like in this sort of that sort of conversion thing because I did I had to do that plenty with some of my own work, to um, playing baseball and ha and having to catch with your opposite hand, and I can hear my I can hear my co-host um, Zan laughing in the background because he's ambidextrous and I'm not, <laughs> but, <laughs> but if you've ever tried to catch a ball with your uh, with your other hand, I'm assuming you're not ambidextrous. Um, then you then you can kind of you can kind of see where I'm going with that. Yeah. Um, especially since there. Side side note: there was a weird story in baseball where a switch hitter and a switch pitcher both lined up, and chaos ensued. Yeah. Because well, well the you'd have the you'd have the pitcher um line up that he's going to pitch from the left, so the batter goes to the other side. Then the pitcher decides, "All right, I'm gonna go to the. I'm gonna pitch from the right." So the batter switches sides too. They keep going at this for about three minutes until all the umps get on the field, immediately demand play stop, huddle to try and figure out what the hell to do because nobody nobody had planned. For, they weren't breaking any rules. Nobody had planned for the the odd chance that you'd have two people who are ambidextrous on the on the field. So, so eventually the rule was made that. Pitcher has priority. Once he's picked a side, the batter ha the batter has to respond and stick to that side. Mm -hmm. uh, this technically happened in the minor leagues, but somebody on the major leagues was watching and made a rule just in case that happened up there. Well, I mean, one of the reasons why we are doing such a large and extensive beta test too, like the if if you're in my, uh, I do have a Discord server mm -hmm. where I invited the the pre campaign VIPs, and every time I host a live stream, I also open it up there. And at the end of the Kickstarter, I will be sending everyone an email saying, "Hey, if you want in, here's the link." Um, and it will be a large and extensive beta test where everyone gets to point out, hey, this isn't working and here's why. Here's why we should change this. Here's this. Um, I listen to all feedback and I make it very clear. 5e is not my game. Don't be afraid to tell me I'm wrong. And that has been very productive hmm. right now. And and the thing is, too, the, the community excitement around this, too, because we've been so open and transparent. Um I don't want to say they're doing my job for me, but a lot of them are. <laughs> like a lot of them have just come in and said, "Hey, Stewart's going to hit 100,000 probably. Let's start working on the spells for him." And I'm like, "Oh, thank you. I I'll take them and probably, you know, pillage the stuff I like, which is what I do in every RPG system. Mm -hmm. I'll pillage what I like and throw it in there. I'll give credit where it's due and then release it um when it's done." Yeah. Now, given the given the classes and subclasses that are avail that are in, um, I know you I know you said that the whole that a lot of this started as a bit a bit a bit of a shit post, mm -hmm. but 
Um, some, but one thing I'd like to to kind of dip in to kind of dip into is some of the inspirations for some of the classes and subclasses and what the what what it what it's tr what it's trying to um what it's, what it's trying to go for what it's trying to go for and what it's tr what it's um loop and inspirations were and absolutely <laughs> so it is this is a bit of a really really stupid Rorschach test <laughs> fair enough um so i'll start i'll give it. i'll give you a name and and we can kind of go into it from there um, okay starting with the jewel crafter yep Which is so, a, which is built built around the artificer. Yep. So uh, before we get deep into that, though, I need to I need to let you and the audience know that that class is going to be removed uh, from the book, at least in the sense of being attached to the artificer. Um, uh, uh, there is a legal issue around that because artificer is not part of the SRD. Hmm. Um, I legally can't use it. We will be changing that to the wizard by the final edition. Oh, but but moving on from that, what what would you say were some of the influences and what and what what play style are you trying to go for with the um, Artificer? The two th big inspirations for our, uh, the Jewel Crafter was World of Warcraft in the gem slotting. I, I think it maybe even originated from Monster Hunter, but um, it is just uh, World of Warcraft Jewel Crafter meets. Um, have you seen Fate Stay Night? Yes, you're probably you're about, you're probably about to bring up Rin. Yes, uh, Rin, uh, definitely best girl, and uh, the inspiration for a good chunk of uh, like the gem grenades specifically. <laughs> All right, the path of the path of the promised. So I don't know exactly where that idea came from. Um, I, like, I just noticed that a lot of, uh, barbarians in 5e all have this weird spiritual journey, and I was just like, how do I waifu that? And I was like, oh, you, you're arranged to be married. And that was really cute, uh, but we have since decided to, uh, we can keep it, like, you're destined to be married if as one of the things, but other ones said, like, uh, what if you're a father who wants to come back to their child, um, can you use it for that? And I'm like, you know what? Restructuring the flavor text on that one's not going to be too hard. We'll go with that. Mm -hmm. uh, the College of Amor. That one is just the horny bard finally statted out. <laughs> I don't know why, but after, like, what what is it? 30 years of D&D &D minimum? I, I, I honestly could not find the actual horny bard statted um you could say the book of erotic fantasy but i read that book cover to cover there is no bard like class that does that <laughs> there is just um like no I, I finally statted it i statted the horny bard the final ability is called harem and i'm not budging on it <laughs> yeah um the cupid domain I would think that one's kind of straightforward. <laughs> um, it's it's uh, you're slowly turning into a cupid, and there you go. <laughs> I've had a run. I've had a running gag of of my of my characters constantly f um, firing arrows into the sky every Valentine's Day. As far as why he's doing that, well, much like Vegeta tries to kill Santa, uh, he's trying to kill Cupid. Fair enough. Oh. Uh, it's not th not the last time I've had those gags. I've had I've had the running gag that the Grim Reaper hates cats because nine lives means nine times the work. Have you seen the new Puss in, Bo Puss in Boots movie? I have. Um, it is it is far be it is far better than I expect than I, than I think anybody expected it to be. It's it's I would argue it's a masterpiece. Like that's a really good movie. And having the having the big bad wolf as the in, as the incarnation of de the incarnation of death, or rather a or rather an agent, um, it certainly is applicable. And mm -hmm. well, you well using well using sickles is going to tickle my fancy because I'm always advocating for weapon variety in in how people equip characters. Mm -hmm. Like instead of instead of doing sword and board, why not replace the sword with a kopesh for just as one example? Uh, 
Are you familiar with what with that particular type of weapon? Yeah, it's uh, an Egyptian weapon. I'm pretty yeah. sure. Um, it it is. Most of them are are obviously going to be made of bronze. But what's stopping someone from making one out of steel in someone's setting? No, that's sick. Like, I I believe um, my sand elf race actually when I when I originally wrote them up, they had uh, kopeshes, mm -hmm. which was culturally inaccurate, but I thought it was cool enough to stick around. <laughs> Rule of cool can let can get away with a lot of things. Absolutely. Um, but the circle of the consortium. Okay, so that one. Um, this is going to be. Uh, I don't know how controversial it is. Uh, you know the song "Cult of Dionysus." Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> that, that that was pretty simple. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> essentially, um, a lot of these classes and subclasses are either meant to emulate, like, a, again, a waifu flavor, an anime flavor, or a style of love, and, like, I, I, yeah, um, Cult of Dionysus, there you go. <laughs> yep. Um, the Battle Bride for the, for the fighter. Oh, okay. That one I loved. I love coming up with that one so much. So I think uh, Fire Emblem Bride class meets uh, Fifth Edition Battle Master. Yeah, ev everybody everybody loves the Battle Master because of largely because of the whole maneuver thing. And you have your own background. This is where I have to bring up how I will eternally have a grudge for how for how. Um, the development of 5e massacred my boy when it came to the maneuver system. Oh yeah. Um, because I I was involved when it w when it was called D and D Next, and yes. within that si within that they were they wanted to introduce a maneuver system. The idea being all of the martial classes would have a list of uh, a list of maneuvers, much like how all the magic classes have a spell list. The idea, the idea being, you'd have a set of maneuver dice, which is largely, largely what would become the superiority die. You could use them to boost attack. I house rule it that you could spend them as a reaction to boost a, to give a give a one time boost to AC, um, or you could spend them on maneuvers. Things like flurry of blows was a maneuver. Um, cleave was a maneuver. Bull rush was a maneuver. Um, and you could spend, and you would get them back at the start of your turn, much like using lands and magic. I thought it was a great way to get to give martial characters more stuff to do because they've been maligned as simple characters, especially the mm -hmm. fighter. That got that got nixed, and a lot of and a lot of that concept just get just got forced into one subtype with the battle master. And even the initial battle master maneuvers were more of them trying to do them trying to um, sandwich that, but with with the with the um, modern version of the martial class from third edition or the warlord from fourth. Mm -hmm. um, as far I didn't bring up Pathfinder in this because there was that particular archetype. There isn't really a equivalent when it comes to the um, primary classes in Pathfinder. Weirdly enough, um, if you go into the mythic rule set, it's very similar to that. Um, I, I don't know how familiar you are with mythic paths. Uh, I, from I am. Path okay, yeah. So it's it's a lot like that where you kind of pick and choose what you want. And um, speaking of, we hit the stretch goal where I'm going to be adding a mythic path for uh, for the waifu book. Mm -hmm. uh, first, first edition is going to be easy. I mean, I already have experience with that. Um, Josh is going to be waiting until the Pathfinder 2E remaster comes out, and then he'll do that. And we are currently writing, like, just on our own time, uh, we are writing Mythic 5E in order to make that work. Yeah, and um, when... <laughs> that that's, that's something that could possibly be a return for, for, a, for a revisit, but... Um, the next one on the list is the way of the housewife for the, for the monk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So deep lore here. There's two, there's two things. The easy one is the way of the house husband web comic, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the easy one. The other one. So originally this book was going to be called the complete housewife handbook. And... <laughs> 
and who boy i people did not like that idea my like i got so much venom for like trying to write it like that and it was weird like and when it comes to me i am that spiteful bastard that if you tell me i can't do something because it's problematic i'm gonna do it harder because don't fucking tell me what to do phrasing and <laughs> sorry i i swore no no i just no i just Oh, okay, right. Sorry, understood, understood. I figured that's what it, I, I figured you were joking. I just wasn't sure, but yeah. Oh, so no, I no. I'm when I do the phrasing thing, that's ripping off of Archer. Understood, understood. Yes. So yeah, don't tell me what to do. I'm going. I'm going to do it harder. And yes, uh, phrasing, uh, giggity. Uh, there we go. <laughs> so I I came up with the complete housewife handbook, and I I got a lot of venom for it. And so I was going, I, I was just going for it. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to com commission 1950s artwork and it's going to recreate all of those things. Like it's a man's world, baby. Like I, I was so angry at people telling me what to do that I was going full on sexist mode. And my buddy literature devil who has been accused of being sexist was like, why don't you just call it the waifu book? And that changed the, that changed everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah. I've, I, I've, I've seen some of lit some of literature devil's um, work. I'm familiar with him. Um, yep. But moving from that, there is the oath of matrimony. That one, um, I just love paladins. Like I, I will say, if fifth edition did anything right, I think paladins have never been in a better place than they are right now. Um, and I like the idea of a paladin getting their magic powers from the uh, from the oath of their marriage. I think that's just super cool, mm -hmm. and I don't think anyone's done that yet, as far as I can tell. I don't. I I don't feel like I don't feel like digging into the deep part of the archives in my temple to to see if that's the case. Um, mm -hmm. But then there is the the bonded pair. So that one, admittedly, okay. Uh, full full disclosure, that one's being trashed. That that entire subtype is being removed because it's just not good. We're going to be coming up with pack leaders soon, and essentially, I was trying to think of a pun that made it very waifu and and relationship based, mm -hmm. but still, but still was rangery. And whenever you think of, uh, whenever you watch a like a documentary, they'll they'll never call like. A, uh, a pair of gooses like a married couple they'll call them a bonded pair mm. and that's what I went with yeah, yeah. Um, then there's partners in crime again it's it's largely there because it's a really good pun mm. and second of all I thought it would be really really cool to come up with a rogue archetype where you do have a partner and I thought that was just neat so, and mm -hmm. how many Bonnie and Clyde jokes did you end up getting Oh, at least at least four. Um, <laughs> just just during the live stream where there was less than thirty people. <laughs> yeah. um, then there is cross blooded with the sorcerer. That one is directly ripped from Pathfinder. We will be we will be keeping that in there for completion's sake, uh, but we will also be adding in um, a unique subclass called I think. Destined Child or something like that. It's where the, the and the flavor text is your parents l were soulmates and they loved each other so much that they created a magic baby. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. what, like, what, like the space baby at the end of 2001? Kinda, yeah. <laughs> I, I imagine the same energy, sure. <laughs> yeah. um, of course, on the other end of that, we have the affair from War from Warlock. Bro, I don't even need to tell you. The sugar daddy warlock joke has been around since fourth edition, and I was like, you know what? Let's stat it. Let's let's just go for it. Let's just finally stat it. Mm -hmm. um, that one is uh, the joke I tell people. It's uh, it's Zeus if he asked for consent. It's... Yeah, I've I've jo I've I've jo I I remember I remember make I remember making a. Greek version of that Batman Beyond meme of do you have the slightest idea how little that narrows it down of, yep. <laughs> with with Batman playing a Greek hero and Blight playing Zeus in that case just going who are, who are you? You banged my mom. Do you have the slightest idea how little that narrows it down? <laughs> oh. And of course with the with the wizard or 
for those who are familiar with Discworld, the wizard. <laughs> yes, you have to add that many Zs. That's how of it course. works. Uh, the love mage. So that one actually was inspired by the book of erotic fantasy. Um, I will admit, uh, coming up with wizards for uh, 5e is definitely a bit more difficult than I originally thought, uh, simply because, um, like, once you have the schools of magic, it's it's pretty it's pretty much covered. So um, in the book of erotic fantasy, there was a class called the Tantrist, where um, you have to, in order to get your spells back, you have to sleep with someone. And it's, I, I have got a story about that book that eventually became a very famous 4chan green text story. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so that, that book was definitely on my mind a lot in college <laughs> and it kind of shows so the way that class is designed is that in order to get all of your abilities you need to take a long rest quote in the arms of another now that could be a lewd encounter or it could be like you snuggle you know like i i made it so that you have to be at least in contact with somebody and the implications there for sure but you don't have to you know yeah um and well, I I will I will note when I when I went through the way of the housewife the the first the first name that the first name that came to mind for me mm -hmm. is um Izumi from Full Metal Alchemist. <laughs> yes! Oh my God! I'm so glad you mentioned that because a lot of people did bring her up. Like everyone was like, "This is based on Izumi, right?" And I'm like, "Kinda," but eh, you know, it's. Um, there's so many, like, really endearing housewives. A lot of people call them sexist. I consider them very endearing. Um, in Asian cultures, there's a lot of housewife, like, jokes. Um, and I, I, we fully embrace that. We just went for it, you know? It's, we, we wanted it to be funny, we wanted it to be charming, and we wanted it to be teamwork-based. Mm -hmm. almost, almost all of these subclasses rely on you to pair up with someone else. Yeah. Now, with the waifu archetype slash prestige class, because um, mm -hmm. you're ha you're having it as a as a prestige class in um, Pathfinder and a archetype in um, in in Pathfinder Second Edition. Mm -hmm. um, with now, when it came, one particular issue that has happened in the past with prestige classes is people uh, is prestige classes having ridiculous levels of prerequisite and people um, building their character not because not for what f what fits for their character at the time but so that down the road they can get that prestige class um, mm -hmm. with the waifu have you have you tried to make sure that 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 particular trap doesn't happen that it's easy to prestige into Oh yeah, it is. Um, I made the barrier for entry super low. You you only need to be a fifth level character, which is standard for all prestige classes. Um, you the special thing is you must conduct a ceremony that costs at least a thousand gold pieces, which is which is very expensive, but it's a wedding, so you know that makes sense. And getting, I the, see that getting you have to get the betrothed the betrothed feat, which it's a feat that's easy to get. Yeah, um, it still requires a feat investment, which will disrupt certain builds. But I felt like it was appropriate enough to qualify for a prestige class. Mm -hmm. And that that feat, the betrothed feat, does evolve if you take the class. Which, I, which, I think I think that helps soften the blow, mm -hmm. because because um, it is it is quite an ask if you're give if you're giving up one of your feat slots, especially if you're. If you're not, if you're not a fighter who's going to be getting feats for days, right? And even fighters, like they'll want to, like you, like when you're playing Pathfinder, because it's a very powerful game, right? Like, um, you want to be as good as you can, as early as you can, even if you don't want to be like the center of attention. You want to be useful to your party, right? Mm -hmm. Like, no one's, no one wants to be the turd that's not contributing at all, unless you're going for a joke build, and even then. But yeah, we wanted to. I, I definitely wanted the bar the my requirements for me was it had to be flexible it had to have a low barrier for entry and it needed to be as appealing as possible and not disrupt a, any kind of build yeah. which which is why in chapter five a lot of the like 
half the characters have the prestige class, and most of them are fairly strong. Mm -hmm. And that that's a, that's another thing to note is that you can have multiple people with that, but they're not not going to the same destination. Because mm -hmm. I've um, I I remember I remember when I would do a, when I would do official plays of say five E, and people would com be complaining that ever, that the characters were starting to get samey. I'm like. Um, one, don't shoot the messenger. Two, <laughs> give give me a few weeks. I'll do something about that. And I'm al I'm also I'm also going to need a keg. <laughs> oh, like, there there are a lot of not sober nights, and me just blasting nightcore until like three in the morning writing this book. <laughs> funny thing, funny thing is, I don't I don't use I don't use nightcore when I'm when I'm writing. I use jazz. Ja okay, so if I'm if I'm coming up with something, um. Other than like D and D stuff, stuff like because again, I've been playing and I've been homebrewing for so long that it's not terribly difficult for me to come up with a concept, um, and I can crank out even an, like even the good skeleton of a class in like an hour or two if you give it to me, um, uh, especially if it's Pathfinder. Um, Nightcore was just very, very good in getting me into the mindset of like writing for this book in particular because it's supposed to be funny, it's supposed to be upbeat and silly. So um, Nightcore, Nightcore is perfect for that. When I'm writing for like my video essays, I will listen to jazz. Yeah. Oh, I will. I I will admit that's a that's a roundabout way for me to for me to bring up um, Hiromi Uehara. If only, if only because I I've enjoyed her work and I'm I was glad to see her get to soundtrack an anime. Could, could sorry, um, Hiromi Uehara, she recently was able to play her play the piano at the summer at the um, Summer Olympics in Tokyo. Oh, that's amazing! Good for her. And um, because of the fact that the anime Blue Giant is all about jazz, they brought her in to handle the soundtrack and play the piano parts for one of the characters. I understand now. I, I didn't realize I totally janked your, your story, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the one of the big things that it that um, this is adding to the proverbial sandbox is the cooking and the camping system, which is that's what I will always appreciate downtime mechanics because that's one of those things that is very underrated in game design. <laughs> so, what what brought on doing doing it, um, cooking and camping as its own system? Uh, largely the Owl Cat games. Um, like if you played Kingmaker Wrath of the Righteous, they had a fairly good cooking system um, that was very engaging to do, and it was quite powerful. Um, and so I was like, yeah, if, if I'm doing a waifu book, I absolutely should add cooking. One, it does lead into, it leans into the themes, and two, it encourages, um, you know, group activity, which is what we want. Um, I did go in and I read, so after the Owlcat games, Paizo completely jacked like everything Owlcat did back into their new King Kingmaker 2.0 and I did buy the Kingmaker uh, companion guide which does have the cooking system in it and I will admit I was quite dissatisfied I am not fond of how they implemented cooking into second edition um, but I did adopt I, I did adopt that pretty heavily into the cooking chapter is I based it a lot off of the second edition books. Well, Owlcat's probably getting the last laugh given given what their next project is. The um, are you are you talking the oh god Warhammer game? Yeah, Rogue Trader. Mm hmm. Good for them. Mm -hmm. and, I'm glad they're getting. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. And um, it it is go it if it is I really I really hope that um in doing. It, are you familiar with what a rogue trader is in the Warhammer world? I the only thing I know about Warhammer is more DACA and paint it red. Yeah. Um, rogue traders are essentially corsairs, legal pirates, as as it were. They are hmm. they are given a they are given a letter of mark that's usually passed along their family, which is why there are rogue trader dynasties to to explore a given region of space for profit and plunder. 
Oh, much in the much in the same way that you had the privateers in the in the age of piracy. Mm -hmm. Um, the idea is, look, you look. Um, as long as you as long as you fuck people's shit in this particular area of space, we are going to look the other way. Mm -hmm. Or or say say the British appro approaching approaching some sailors and going, look, I know I know you guys like to fuck shit up, but if you guys go fuck up the 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 shit of the Spanish. We're perfectly cool with that. We're not. We're not <laughs> going to prosecute you if you go fuck. If you go fuck up the shit, the shit of the Spanish or the French. It's mm. that's that's kind of the, that's kind of the approach with rogue traders, which is why I think it's I think it's going to be a interesting set of possibilities. Mm -hmm. You know, to play as a rogue trader in this area of space where you you don't have where there are certain rules obviously you have to follow, but. As far, but for the most part, um, whether or not you keep what you steal, that's up. That's up to you. Just be careful with what you take in case it's tainted. Right. But you know that whole that whole it's a natural evolution of what the, of what they had been doing since King since Kingmaker of managing a domain. And when it comes. I know that you you had said that you ha you had some issues with how um camp with how camping worked in um in that back adaptation that Pathfinder is doing. Mm -hmm. What in what in particular was the issue with it, and what did you try to address with your take? So I I the one thing I didn't like is that they limited the skills in a very confusing way. Um, the cooking system in the Kingmaker companion book, um, one, like, uh, it, it was very, it was very, it was not that powerful. It was also super specific and it didn't last very long. One of the things that was really weird is like, you can start camp, you can cook a meal and then, the meal buff, like, unless you critically succeeded, only lasted until you began, like, preparations the next day. So, like, the buff only lasted while you were asleep. Um, and I think the presumption is that you would get jumped in the middle of the night. And I was very confused by this because, one, that's that's not fun. I, at least in my opinion, I, I don't like campground battles are fun. Like you said, it's a spice once in a while. But if you're prepping meals under the presumption that you're going to get jumped in the middle of the night, like you need a you need a different way to camp. <laughs> um, as, and I, as I, I, somebody who did who's, do, who's done his fair share of camping and dealt with the hell of pitching a tent. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. It, it's. It was very frustrating to read that a lot of the abilities only lasted for like eight hours <laughs> or until you prepped for the next day. Um, so I changed all that. Uh, all the buffs last 24 hours minimum. Mm -hmm. um, I also changed a lot of the skill requirements. Uh, for example, uh, I think in Kingmaker, they only let you use either cooking lore or survival, which is quite disappointing because crafting is sitting right there with fuck all to do, you know? <laughs> like, um so we we put it in for crafting as well and a couple other things um essentially we want to make certain skills that aren't very popular like popular again um and that was a lot of it the other thing that i felt uh disappointed by was so for example there is a powerful dish in kingmaker called like the purple stew or something like that. And the idea is that you kill a purple worm, take its guts, and make a stew with it. And, like, in the Kingmaker video game, that was very easy to implement, uh, because they, you could plan out where you encounter those things. Um, in the tabletop game, it required, like, X number of special ingredients, or X number of basic ingredients. Um, I added a system in called Substitution, where instead of spending the ingredients, if you killed a monster that would qualify for it um, at a certain encounter rate or monster level, you can substitute all of that for all the ingredients, and you can feed your entire camp with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I do, I do appreciate that there, that um, you have a variety, you have a variety of of meal Im of meal images. Um, I am curious if, if um, because if you, I know it'd be ridiculous to ask for to ask for a proper cookbook, but there was a proper recipe book in <laughs> in Hellas, 
So a precedent has been set. I, oh man, I, this is the curse of success. So I hired an artist to who I, I, I think she did one piece of artwork for me ever. And I said, Hey, can you do food? And she said, for sure. And she turned in this gorgeous, like photorealistic artwork of this most delicious looking fantasy food I have ever seen. And I'm like, people are going to ask for a cookbook and I'm not a cook. I'm not a chef. I know nothing of cooking. Um, my solution is coconut oil and butter for everything. <laughs> so I could not tell you, I wouldn't even begin to know how to make a cookbook. I'm so sorry. We are no not worries. including a cookbook. <laughs> of, cor of course. I, of course. Some I notice are a bit more mundane, but I'm still not touching them. Like the, Ghost fire roasted peppers, because mm -hmm. I've had I had to I had to eat the Carolina Reaper because I lost a bet once a few years ago, and um, I'm never do I'm never touching th those sort of peppers ever again. I when I was younger, you know, in teenage years, early twenties, I would eat everything spicy because, like, oh, I'm manly, I can eat something spicy. And now that I'm, you know, approaching, I'm approaching mid thirties, I'm like, you know what? Just flavor it enough so I can taste it. I don't want to taste fire. <laughs> the Carolina Reaper, while kind of tasty in certain amounts, not fun. <laughs> no, especially when you end up eating the whole thing like I did. Well, you're a fool. <laughs> <laughs> a braver fool than I. I'd li I'd like to say that, but I have but I have a long history of do of doing crazy and stupid things, or or just down or just downright villainous things on April Fool's Day. Um, I think ch chief among them was when I reprinted somebody's player's handbook for um, three point five because he lost his originally. What I didn't tell him is I printed all the text mirror written. Sorry. All of the text was mirror written. Okay. Uh, could you define that for me? I'm, I'm a little confused. Uh, I apologize. The text was upside down and backwards, so you had to hold it up to a mirror in order to read it. Oh. Huh. So imagine the three the three point five e player's handbook, um, but you have to you have to hold up like a hand mirror in order to read it. <laughs> hmm. Interesting idea, but no, thank you. <laughs> it was it, it, I gave it to him on April Fool's Day. He should he knew what he what he signed up for. Um, there there was the whole thing of setting up a program in people's computers so that the CD tray would open every ninety seconds. <clears throat> then you close it, and then ninety seconds later, it opens right back up. It's a great way to drive people with o with OCD insane. Um. I set up some lawn signs once that said free t-shirts, turn right, but if you followed the directions, you'd be driving in circles. <laughs> oh. And of course, in my own, in my, and some of my early stuff as a player, um, I wanted to play a thief, but I wanted to be a thief that wasn't doing the whole check for traps, he was a trap maker, because I outright told my GM, you ever see a Chuck Jones cartoon? That's what I want to do. Okay. Like he he was the type of people who he was the type who would make a fake wall just to make people run into it. You know, the old gag of the wall that look that looks like a real tunnel but it isn't. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um there was the up button which what which was a rune trap where you step on the thing, you go straight up. Um, <laughs> also also known as the eject button. And it's te it's technically casting fly on your s on whoever steps on it for about six seconds at forty miles an hour. Um, end of the campaign, we're up against a dragon. He steps on the trap, ends up hitting the ceiling, which is lined with adamantite. And because that because it's adamantite, that stuff doesn't budge for anybody. He's got nowhere to go, but he still has to go up. So the dragon got compacted. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. We all had to we all had to take con saves to loot to avoid losing our lunch from seeing all of the leftovers. <clears throat> you ever see a car got get compacted? Um Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's like that. Just on the ceiling. Gotcha. I I, I understand the imagery we we're going for. Mm -hmm. I do. <laughs> yeah, but um Given th given that there's a handful of NPCs that are that are within the book, um, mm -hmm. which 
for all, for all intents and purposes, may as well be the um, mascots of the of the, of this book. Mm-hmm. I am I am a bit curious if down if down the road you have you have plans on doing um, say say a say a one off module with some of the rules. Well, one of the stretch goals. Um, so when I made this, I had no idea like if we would make you know i had no idea what we would make i i did a program and i essentially signed up with a company called launch boom where um our goal was to get it funded in under a day and it did do that um but i had no idea how much money we would possibly make so i set the stretch goals up to two hundred thousand, and at two hundred thousand, um i have uh that I have promised here that we'll release a volume two of the book in the volume two. There'll be a set of monsters. There'll be a setting and there'll be a level one to 20 adventure with possible mythic path one to 10, um, uh, like side quests. Mm Mm-hmm. So I do want to do a setting. Um, if if we only get this book funded, which I am fine with, I am not, I am, I'm almost hoping we don't hit 150 because at 150 I had to do a volume two. Um, I'm almost hoping we do sub 150 and I could just put everything in this book that I want to. Next year I'm releasing a new Kickstarter for a book called The Complete Shonen Handbook which will uh, basically be the male half of this book. Um, Once both the waifu and shonen handbook are done, I plan to do a setting book. Mm -hmm. And because I'm the one doing pretty much everything outside of some 2e content, like I, I like all the, the entire settings, mine, like the story, like I, I'm the only writer. So I, I'm expecting one big book a year. (laughs) Yeah. At the moment. I can, Mm -hmm. um, I can get, I can certainly get that. Mm -hmm. Um, And what, what would you be shooting for as far as far as the base page count ca- page count? At the moment the page count is two hundred and twelve. I will I have got my um prototype prints. Uh there is some stuff that I I will do to it in order to reduce the page count a little bit. But with all the stretch goals achieved that I'm hoping we achieve, I suspect this will be a two hundred and fifty page count book. Mm-hmm. That's a that's a pretty reasonable size, I'd say. Mm-hmm. But I know I will. I will certainly be keeping an eye on the glorious insanity that comes about through it. Mm-hmm. But with, I appreciate that. <laughs> with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zones to come all the way to my temple. <laughs> I I appreciate you having me, man. Um, not a lot of people in the D and D space are giving me the time of day because they're. I it did not occur to me that uh, one anime shit just isn't well liked in the circle, and two, uh, the people who do like the anime shit seem to think that waifu is sexist, and I'm like, oh, that's a bummer, <laughs> you know. I re- I remember Avenue Q singing, "Everyone's a little bit racist." That, that yeah, that's how I live. That's how I live my life. I've, I've, like, my best friend is Latino. I had an ex girlfriend who's black. Um, like, race and sex has never been a factor that I care about. But the internet made me care about it, and I will never forgive the internet for that. You know? Yeah, I can, so. I can certainly get that. Oh, mm-hmm. Well, here, here in the temple, we are, we are equal opportunity assholes. We only apologize to anyone we haven't offended yet. <laughs> I love that. I nope. will be stealing that. Thank you. <laughs> don't wor- don't worry. You don't worry. You'll get your turn. Everybody get, everybody gets their turn because that is how we achieve true equality. Every, every everyone <laughs> everyone gets the roast. <laughs> I respect the hell out of that. That's great. <laughs> Cuz that way nobody can ever claim that they're being treated special because we treat everyone equally horrible and the dice gods treat us equally horrible. So it all so it all goes around. Hmm. Oh. Uh, plus um anybody who's looking to be offended in the temple has has no place in the temple. We we kick them out. Sometimes yep. sometimes literally sometimes firing them out of the out of the catapult. 
Fair it's enough. Because the temple is sacred ground, it is holy ground, and... Well, you've seen Highlander. I have. Never fight on holy ground. <laughs> Good point. But with that, with that said, a sincere, th a sincere thanks once again to you and to everyone who took the time to enjoy the insanity that happens here. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then. On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>